Let's kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we have so much thankfulness and praise on our hearts right now. We thank you for bringing us through a restful night. Lord, when you, you protected us, and we just pray now that you would pour out your spirit. We pray that your spirit would be poured in each heart that's in this room at this time. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us a teachable heart, a humble heart. And Lord, we also ask a special portion of your Holy Spirit to be poured out on our brother Russell right now. That as he breaks the bread of life to us right now, Lord, that you would speak through your servant and our hearts would be ready to hear what you would have us to learn. So, Lord, we ask a blessing boldly and we thank you because we know that you will answer this prayer. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. For the sake of those who may have, may have a little difficulty in following um, some of the things that I was saying yesterday, um, I will venture to go over um, or to try to smooth over some of the points and to um, lead me into um, this morning's presentation. So I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 17. And verse eight, verse seven, sorry. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. There are several ways that John illustrates this point of the woman and the, the beast that carry of her. And if you will go with me to Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 12. As John speaks here concerning the rise of the papacy as it's um, gaining control of, or rather as the mystery of iniquity is gaining control of the church. Verse 12 says, And the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which had this sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, and taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Here, the revelator, or Jesus rather, brings to view the history of Balaam and Balak to describe the relationship between the church and the state. Balaam, remember, was a prophet of God who apostatized and united with the state, Balak, to cast a stumbling block in the way of Israel by sending Moab in to um, seduce Israel. If you, if you will focus on the, the way the papacy gained control of the Christian church, or the mystery of iniquity gained control of the Christian church, um, and as you ponder on what Jesus is saying here concerning Balak and Balaam, and Balaam representing the church, the Roman church, and Balak representing the state. An, an, an element is meeting, missing, out, missing out of this, um, well, a character is missing in this um, representation of the situation that was taking place under the church of Pergamos, and that is Moab. But as the story developed, 
you will see that you will see that between Balaam and Balak, Moab is developed, and Moab is sent is sent in to seduce Israel to commit fornication. This, the, the situation between Balaam and Balak reaches its peak in 538, where the papacy now has full control over the churches in Europe. Um, and Jesus introduces a new character, and I want you to go with me to verse 20 of the same chapter. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, referring to the church of Thyatira, that's the church following the church of Pergamos, 538 to 1798 is a period for the church of Thyatira. He says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Here again, Jesus refers to the church of Rome as Jezebel. And reflecting on the history of, the history of um, Israel in the time period of when Ahab ruled, you will see that Jezebel influenced Ahab into setting up um, false gods in Israel, false system of worship in Israel. But Jezebel, Jezebel worked together with a group of prophets or rather false prophets, prophets of Baal, in seducing Israel into this apostasy. But you do not see here brought to view the false prophet. But remember that in that time period, between 538 to 1798, there was a time, this, that period is known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages, for the, re the reason being, God's Spirit is being withheld at that point in time. Now, if you go back to the story of Jezebel, you will notice that when, when Elijah came to, when Elijah was sent to the king, Ahab, one of the things he said to the king was that God will withheld the rain withhold the rain from falling on the land for three and a half years. And you will see that this was the case in the Dark Ages. For three and a half prophetic years, God withheld his spirit in that time period. Remember, following, following the three and a half years, Elijah returns, and he, he challenges the false prophet to a, to a duel at Carmel. At Carmel... God's, you remember, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the story that the two altars were erected at Carmel and the God that answered by fire would, 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 would be considered to be the true God. And remember that the fire came down upon Elijah's altar and it, a clear distinction was made between who were the true prophets and who were the false prophets. This is what is brought to view as we were considering yesterday that the woman... Remember that the false prophets were carrying out the agenda of Jezebel. And if you will remember yesterday, we, we, we said 1798, the papacy received a deadly wound. And remember that Jesus refers to the papacy as Jezebel. And as we considered this area here, 1840 to 1844, Ellen White refers to this area, this, this particular point in time, 1840 to 1844, she says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a manifestation of the power of God. And she compares it to Pentecost, and she compares it to the angel of Revelation 18. So there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit there, as it took place at Carmel. So remember, at the end of, 18, at the end of that time period, the false prophets emerged, which were the fallen churches of Babylon. So you have to conclude that in the time period when Jezebel, when Jezebel ruled the state, Ahab, 538 to 1798, um, the false prophets were developed. And the false prophets and the true prophets went up to Carmel. Carmel being 1840 to 1844, the odd point of the Holy Spirit, and that determined 
who was the true prophet and who was the false prophet. The Adventist church became the Elijah of God and the churches of Babylon became the false prophet. That is illustrated in several of the Old Testament history. And this is what is, this is the basic um, understanding for Revelation 17 when it describes this beast that is ascending out of the earth carrying the woman, carrying the agenda of Jezebel. And as they're going up to the judgment time period to reveal who is the true and the false prophet, where God's spirit is outpoured upon Elijah's altar to uh, reveal the false from the true. Now, I want you to go with me to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 5. Proverbs. Chapter 25 and verse 5. I'm not going to read all of it, but um, you should be able to follow with me. It states that a king's throne shall be established in righteousness. I have just extracted that which I wanted from the verse. A king's throne shall be established in righteousness. In Proverbs chapter 16 verse 12 states, the king's throne is established by righteousness. One says it's established in righteousness, and another says it's established by righteousness. But the throne of the dragon is established through a process the Bible refers to as the mystery of iniquity. Through the process of the mystery of iniquity. If you'll go with me to, to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, the, the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In the Great Controversy, page 50, Ellen White tells us how Satan will accomplish this boast. She says, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to sit himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Remember that God will, he will establish his throne by righteousness and in righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But Satan wants to sit upon the mount of the congregation, which we are. But it is God's throne that should be established in us. But Satan will establish his throne through iniquity, the mystery of iniquity. The Apostle Paul, as he, as he saw the rise of the mystery of iniquity in accomplishing this purpose of Satan, um, he, was, uh, he was alarmed at it and thought it was necessary to write to the church concerning the rise of this power that would enable Satan to accomplish his boast. Um, in several Bible commentaries, page 980, paragraph 6, Ellen White reporting on this, she says, the, the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians foretold the great apost apost apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ should not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And furthermore, the apostle warns his brethren that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors that will prepare the way for the development of the papacy. 
really the development of the throne of Satan <coughs> over the mount of the congregation. She says, little by little, at first, in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Remember, this is about setting the throne up in the hearts of men. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of hedonism found their way into the, into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased and Christianity in, in, entered the courts of the palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. In place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. <coughs> the nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing, and the world, which is the dragon, arrayed in, in robes of righteousness, walked into the church. Now, the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and substitutions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. So, as you can see that the throne of Satan was set up in the hearts of men through the doctrines of the papacy. And it is the mystery of iniquity as it's unfolding. Now, if you will go with me to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, As John is describing this very same mystery, the mystery of iniquity, how this um, mysterious force gains control over the minds of men, um, and how the change from one phase into another is being accomplished. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, we read, Concerning, concerning the time period of the deadly wound of the papacy, or rather, the throne is being changed from one head to another. He says, The beast that thou sawest was before 1798, is not at the point in time that John is standing, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. This beast still lives in this new power that is rising, this new government that is rising, this new form that the mystery of iniquity is, uh, is assuming. And as we, as we went through the illustration of Jezebel and her false prophet, um, we can understand that this is, the, this, this is depicting the mystery of iniquity, how Jezebel accomplishes her work in the hearts of, pro, of the Protestant churches, and now they were, carrying, they were carrying her to the judgment. But really, they were carrying the throne of Satan, and they, they didn't realize it. If you will go with me to Daniel chapter 7, In Daniel 7, verse, ni verse 9, speaking on the same issue, 7 verse 9, um, well, I'll back up a bit to verse 8, um, concerning the dreadful and terrible beast which has seven heads and ten horns. He said, and I considered the horns, he considered the ten horns, 
And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns, horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So he beheld the papacy as, or he beheld the mystery of iniquity as it was unfolding and as it gained control of, of the churches in Europe or as it gained control of Christianity. Um, verse 9, John jumps to the judgment. Sorry, Daniel jumps to the, to the judgment. He says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments was white as snow, and the hair of his hair like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. In verse 11, he says, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. He beheld the little horn in the judgment. We, by now, we know that the, the time period that John or Daniel is pointing to is 1844 when the judgment opened and the little horn is seen here in this judgment. But remember that as the false prophets were representing Jezebel, so were the false prophets representing Jezebel in this judgment. Remember, the end of this judgment was Babylon is fallen. The false prophets were made manifest, and God placed a tag upon them, Babylon. Babylon is fallen in the judgment. But really, if the little horn was being judged, it is her doctrines that led them to, re to resist the word of God. Um, I'd like to read a statement. The sin of blasphemy, that's taken from the faith I live by, says the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not lie in the sudden word or deed. It is the firm, determined resistance of the truth and evidence. It is not that God sends out a, dec a decree that man shall not be saved. He does not throw darkness before the eyes which cannot be penetrated. But man at first resists a motion of the Spirit of God. And having once resisted it, it is less difficult to do so the second time. Less the third and far less the fourth. Ellen White says concerning the truth for this time, she says, If the truth for this time, you shall receive power, page 245. If the signs that are thickening on every hand that testify that the end of all things is at hand, are not sufficient to arouse your sleeping energy of, of those who profess to know the truth, then darkness proportionate to the light which has been shining will overtake those souls. She says, there is not the semblance of an excuse for, the in, for their indifference that they will be able to, be, to present to God in the great day of final reckoning. There will be no reason to offer as to why they did not live and walk and work in the light of the sacred truth of the word of God and thus reveal to a sin-darkened sin world through their conduct, their sympathy, and their zeal that the power and reality of the gospel could not be controverted. controverted. The third angel's message talking about resistance and talking about the truth for this time and the signs that are thickening on every hand. She says, there is to be in the Seventh-day Adventist churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will, it will not be moved upon, sorry, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door to the heart by confession and repentance. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears that they will brace themselves and they will brace themselves to resist it. Because the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations, they will oppose the work. Why, they say, should we not, should we not, 
should we not know the Spirit of God when we have been in the work so many years? The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. I want you to consider some of the things that we've been talking about as I, before I do that, um, I think you, 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 you're most likely to be able to see it um, from here, what I want to say before I move over to the slide I just went to. Um, 1798, of that, 1798 is, illustrated, is illustrated in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And I want you to go there with me, Daniel 11, verse 40. And we read at, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. We know that Daniel is referring to here, 1798 at the time of the end when atheistic France inflicted a deadly wound upon the papacy. I want you to notice that there is a colon there, and following that it says that, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. If we label the two, the, 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 the two portions of, or the two um, segments of verse 40, a and B, the deadly wound of the papacy, and B, the return of the papacy. Um, I want you to now pay attention to the slide, and you will notice that 1798, A of verse 40, and somewhere after 1844 is B of verse 40. But I want you to notice that the events of 1798 is connected with the events of 1840 to 1844. You cannot exclude it, as you well understand that this is the, this is the rise of, apost of, a, of apostate Protestantism as she's carrying out the agenda and as, they, as she, the false prophet, is carrying Jezebel's agenda to the judgment time period. So I want you to notice that 1798 to 1844 is definitely connected the events, uh, succession leading all the way to the judgment hour and it cannot be excluded. I want you to notice that the second part of verse 40, B, 1989, where the papacy is returning, it is connected with the events that lead up to Michael standing up in Daniel 12, 1. If you will just hold that thought into, in, in your mind, um, Then, I know this, it, it, looks, it, looks, it looks cluttered at, at the moment, um, so if you will just pay attention to the, mu to the mouse pointer, uh, then all that clutter wouldn't butter your eyes. Daniel 11 verse 40, you will notice that it's broken up into two sections, um, 1798 and 1989, right here. 1798, the movements um, of the woman being carried by the beast to the time period of 1840 to 1844. Remember that 1840 to 1844 was a manifestation of the power of God. God's spirit is being poured out. The angel of the, with the little book descending um, with the purpose of sealing God's people or separating them from those who are carrying the woman or carrying the throne of Satan. In 1840, that light that was shining there um, in, in reference to the understanding of, of um, Revelation 9, the Ottoman Empire, the fall of it as Josiah Lynch predicted it, its fall, remember that became a great impetus. It, it pushed, it propelled the message to every missionary outpost in the world. I want you to go with me to First John, sorry, St. John chapter 1. 
and verse 5. Remembering that, remembering that the angel that descended in 1840 with the little book open in his hand was a personage, Ellen White says, of Jesus Christ. And St. John chapter 1, verse 5 says, And the light, even that light, Jesus himself, as it came to the Jewish nation, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This was a very, this was a very, um, this was being fulfilled again in 1840, as the angel, the personage of Jesus, descended with the little book in his hand, opened the darkness, or rather, I can say it now, the false prophet who had the intelligence of Rome could not comprehend the light. And as a result of that, they became the reason why Rome gained a moral victory over Protestant America in 1844. The churches suffered a moral fall. In other words, Rome entered the glorious land spiritually, 1841. So 1840 became a gateway. Had the foolish virgins understand, understood the message, comprehended the light, Protestant America would not have, the second angel's message would not have been fulfilled upon the churches in the United States of America. Babylon is fallen had they comprehended the light. So you have to conclude that the foolish virgins became the gateway for the papacy to enter the glorious land. Remember, this was the hour of judgment. These were the events that were taking place, 1841. Now remember, that test came to the United States of America first. But the, the, remember, the delight that came in that time period, it, 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 it began to swell. And as, as the other one described it, she says it was a manifestation of the power of God, and it went to every, every missionary outpost in the world. It radiated out of the United States of America. So... That light brought the same test to the rest of the world, 1842. 1842, again, the darkness did not comprehend the light. So the papacy gained a moral victory over Protestantism worldwide. Close the door to the churches. Close the door to the churches. That's right. Jeff said. 1843. If you'll go with me to Daniel 12.12. 12. <coughs> Daniel 12.12. 12. Jesus pointing to the time period of 1843. He says, Sorry. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. That 1335 period ended in 1843 when the five wise virgins had been sealed into the message of, into the message of the hour. They knew by intelligently understanding the message, by settling into that truth, that they were correct in their interpretation and understanding of the message for that hour. The foolish virgins were, were sealed in darkness. Remember the statement we read earlier on. She says, if the truth for this time, if the signs that are thickening on, on, that are thickening on every hand, that testify that the end of all things is at hand, are not sufficient to arouse your sleeping energy of those who profess to know the truth, then darkness proportionate to the light which, is, which has been shining will overtake these souls. This was the case of the foolish virgins. In, when we came to the hour of 1843, remember that the first and second angels' message was proclaimed with great power in 1843 to 1844. This was a testimony time between the two classes. 1844, the churches threw the messages out, blocked the message, then Michael stood up. 
in judgment. Now, the events, remember, when the angel descended with the little book in his hand, and he uttered the seven thunders. And Ellen White says, the seven thunders was a delineation of events that were to transpire under the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages. The events have just described to you, you've been studying them for a while in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It is precisely the same events. If you will go with me to um, Daniel 11, This time we're beginning at verse, at the second part, part B of verse 40. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and he shall overflow and pass over. 1989, we see the battle between um, the United States of America, the papacy, Rome, and the Soviet Union. I want you to remember the Soviet, the Soviet Union is the king of the south. I want you to reflect now on 1798, the battle between atheism, the king of the south, atheistic France, and Rome. The outcome of this was that there was a change of heads where Rome, or the agenda of Rome, is now being transferred into this new beast that is rising. 1989 is no different. The free components, or, the, or the, free, the free powers are present, the very same powers are present in 1989 that, were, that, that fought that battle in 1798. You have the King of the South, you have France, so you have the King of the South, and you have the United States of America, and you have Rome. Now, the United States of America dedicated its arms to the papacy in 1989. Here you have a graphic demonstration of the woman ascending the beast or climbing, climbing back on top of this beast. Remember, she, remember that it is depicted in 1798 as the papacy being dethroned or taken off the beast power. But now you see a graphic representation in, in 1989 of the papacy ascending the beast. So it is clear that the next movement by this beast power, the, 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 the glorious land, in fulfillment, ful, fulfillment of Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. That is, the, that is the object of this beast power, to bring the whole world to worship the first beast. So it is clear that this woman, Catholicism, is being carried by this beast, beginning in 1989. Spiritually, it was the case of 1798, as the false prophets were carrying the agenda of Jezebel to the judgment hour. Now, remember that the angel of Revelation Ten descended with an increase of knowledge. And that increase of knowledge, the foolish virgins, the false prophets, did not comprehend that light. As a result, they became the gateway by which Rome entered spiritually into the glorious land. In like manner, the case of verse 41, I want you to do Go with me to verse 41. And he shall enter also into the glorious land. The reason for um, Rome entering into the glorious land is because the foolish virgins again do not comprehend the light. So, somewhere between 1989 and Rome entering the glorious land, the angel of Revelation 18 should begin his descent. Amen. 
in order to prepare a people to stand. In just be before Michael stands up. So if you notice that the very same events that, tra that transpired between 1798 and 1844 are repeating themselves, 1989, to Michael standing up, Daniel 12, 1. If you follow in these events, again, I will repeat, it is because the foolish virgins or the false prophet do not comprehend the light. The light that is shining. As Ellen White says, if the truth for this time, if the events that are thickening on every hand are not sufficient to arouse your sleeping energies, you will become one of those foolish virgins. Darkness, she says, proportion to the light which is shining will overtake those souls. After entering the glorious land, we know the test comes to the world. Verse 42. Verse 42 says, And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But this is the same event that took place in 1842, 1842 time period, when he entered the glorious land because the light was not comprehended. Remember that light now radiated to every missionary outpost in the world from the United States of America. And the same test came. Again, the foolish virgins did not comprehend the light. In like manner, verse 42, as this light swells, as the angel of Revelation 18 swells into a light, it swells, it is swelling, it will reach the other countries of the world. And again, the foolish virgins will not comprehend the light. And therefore, Rome will enter into the land of Egypt. Her entrance means the, in, the institution of the Sunday law, or Sunday law being legislated. Verse 43 is where Rome gained control over treasuries of Egypt. No man can buy or sell ex except their in, in, they are in agreement with the Roman Catholic agenda. Verse 44. So verse 43 can be parallel with 1843, the blessed hour. If Rome has reached her, her fullness in verse 43, then it is obvious that, that God's people are also ready for the final demonstration. Now, which, which is depicted in verse 44 of Daniel 11. Verse 44 of Daniel 11, we're told that tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. This is a loud cry as it swells when the Sunday laws become universal. This was the case of 1843 to 1844 when the message went forth with great power. But what followed that? loud cry or that midnight cry in 1844 was the, the churches blocked the message. And this is what is brought to view in verse 45. Verse 45 of Daniel 11 states, And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. As you see, the message is being blocked as it was blocked in 1844. What followed that was Daniel 12, 1. Michael stands up. It is clear that, and I want to refresh your memory again, that part A of verse 40 is connected with the movements of 1840 to 1844. Part B of verse 40 is connected with the events of verse, 40, verse 41, to Daniel 12, 1. Now, the angel descended with this little book in his hand as he delineated to John the events that were to transpire under the first and second angel's messages. It is clear that the first and second angel's messages, the first and second angel's messages, messages are the third angel's message. They are all three messages are one message. And if you remember, if you will go with me to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. I'm 
And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The everlasting gospel, remember, was first preached in Eden to separate the seed of the serpent and the seed of the, from the seed of the woman. That is the purpose of the everlasting gospel. And that is that when the everlasting gospel was preached in the time period of 1840 to 1844, it was about separating God's people from those who were carrying the, who was, who were carrying the woman. If you notice the wording of the third angel's message, or before I do that, remember that the outcome of the everlasting gospel, the work that the everlasting gospel has done in the 1840-1844 time period, was that this beast that was carrying the woman, or the foolish virgins that was carrying the woman, became Babylon. They, and from, there, from, from 1844 onwards, the revelator began to refer to this power as the image of the beast. Um, if you will go with me to verse uh, 9 of Revelation 14, as we read the third angel's message, states, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image. Now the beast we, we know to mean here represented by the, it's what it represents the first beast power. It represents the woman, represents Catholicism. And the image beasts are, are the foolish virgins that have rejected the message. Protestant America. So, if we, we could reword this a little bit. Um, if any man worship the woman and the beast that carry her. For, this is the third angel's message. It was the very same message proclaimed in 1840, 1844. Worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of water, and not the woman and the beast that carry her. As you can see, the first and second angel's messages are dealing with the same, the same issues as the third angel's message. Reflecting again to, to, to connect the first and second angels' messages with the events that are transpiring, as we, we, remember, we, just, we have just examined the events that are transpiring, that transpired on, in the time period of 1840 to 1844, and we see that we saw that it, it is the very same events that, that are transpiring um, beginning 1989 to Daniel 12:1, the very same events. Then, as you examine the message of the third, as you examine the very wording of the first and second angel's message, you will come to realize that, that the first and second angel's message is actually describing the events that are transpiring. It's actually describing the events that are transpiring. A separation from the woman and the beast that carry her. Um, it is actually describing how the, how the mystery of iniquity um, gains control over the minds of men. How God gave them every opportunity to repent and to accept his message, but they refuse. And as a result of that, Satan, as Ellen White described in early writings, page, 100, page 55, she says Satan was now presiding over them. As you, as you realize now, two thrones are being set up, one in the holy place and the other in the most holy place over the minds of men. This is the issue that has been brought to view here. And now, under the third angel's message, the events that are transpiring clearly are the events of 40 to 45. Part B to Michael standing up. Part B of verse 40 to Michael standing up. Therefore, the, the third angel's message is describing the very events that are transpiring in those verses how the mystery of iniquity gained control over the minds of men, over the, in, 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 over the earth. Now, it is clear that to resist 
or to call or to, to, to resist Daniel 11, 40 to 45 or to downplay it is to resist this angel that descended in Revelation 10 and that is descending in Revelation chapter 18. We, we, we can say with certainty that, that the angel of Revelation 18 has begun his descent. As Jeff was saying last night, the latter rain has begun to sprinkle. As you can well see that I'm struggling to, to, to find the right words to put, to put the thoughts together. But there will come a time when we will speak those things as, as Jeremiah referred to them, referred to those who will be pro proclaiming this message. They will be expert marksmen as they shoot the arrows against the king of Babylon. But at this point in time, the latter rain is sprinkling. We, the, the truth for this time, the understanding of the latter rain is clear. That as Ellen White puts it, when the proclamation was made, if you will go with me to Revelation chapter 10. Verse, uh, verse 6 of Revelation 10. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Ellen White said that, she said that when this proclamation was made, she said, the book of Daniel was now unsealed. And I will read the statement for you in Second Selected Messages, page 104, which is on the screen. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel which related to the last days. The scripture says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed. And the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth by the increase, and I'm going to add a word to it, of this knowledge. A people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. The importance of this little book I believe you, you, if you've been following what I'm saying, you will see why she's saying that, that the third angel's message will not be comprehended. As many look at prophecy, look at the, look at the study of 40 to 45 as a, non, as a minor issue in salvation. But as you can see that it determined the, the destiny of the foolish virgins and the wise virgin. In like manner, as this angel is descending, it is, it is determining our destiny right now, even right now, how, as we comprehend this light. If you go with me to Daniel chapter 12, concerning this little book, Right. Somebody said it already. The Spirit of the Lord is moving. Concerning this little book, but I want you to look at verse 4 with me, first of all. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And remember, Ellen White says, when the book was opened, when the proclamation was made, time shall be no more. The book of Daniel is now on seal. In verse 6, in verse 5, Daniel says, And I, Daniel, look, and behold, there stood one. There stood other two. There stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The very question that is being answered to John in the seven thunders. And I heard a man 
clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Verse 8, Daniel says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The wise shall understand the mysteries that are contained in this little book, which was uttered in the seven thunders. As you will see that it is important, she says, by the increase of that knowledge, our people are to be prepared to stand in the latter days. My brothers and sisters, to resist this message is suicide. To not take it seriously, to not let it occupy the first the first position in your mind um, is throwing away your, your, your entire future. She says, by pen and voice, we are to, we are to sound the proclamation, showing the order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third, a third without the first and second. These messages are to be given to the world in publications, in discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. It is important for us to be able to see and understand the mysteries that were that, that was sounded in the seven thunders and to bring it into our Christian experience that we too, like the wise virgins, will be prepared by the time this Sunday law or before this Sunday law becomes global. Amen.